There's so much stuff out there, mm -hmm. and uh, one of the things I've realized is I've studied other successful people, and as I've interacted or heard from all of these great thought leaders that I mentioned earlier, is everything that you ever need is online today or in a library. You're listening to Business Lunch with Roland Frazier. This is your seat at the table. Hey everybody, it's Roland Frazier here with Business Lunch, and I'm very excited today to have a conversation with my guest, Brad Blazer. Brad, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Roland. It's great to be here. And um, and so I pronounce everything right. It's uh, your name is spelled B L A Z A R, but it is pronounced Blazer. Is that correct? correct? That is correct. You Fantastic. Bet. Well, so now what I'd love to do is just kind of share with folks where you are today in terms of your business, what, what kind of what the business is. What's the name of the business? The name of the business is Learn to Soar. Learn to Soar, S-O-A-R, like flying, right? You get it, yeah. Okay, cool. And, um, and where did that come from? Uh, it actually came from the title of the book. The, the book was released earlier this year back in May, and it's called On the Wings of Eagles, okay. Learning to Soar in Life. Nice. And it's really just uh, the compilation of a bunch of messages and stories from great thought leaders I've met and interacted with, people like Magic Johnson, George W. Bush, uh, Fran Tarkenton, Joe Namath, Rudy Rudiger, Kevin O'Leary, and others. And so they represent the eagles. They're obviously soaring where people want to be. And so that's how we came up with the name Learn to Soar. How'd you meet all those people? Um, through public speaking events. Yeah. Uh, either heard them as keynotes or have actually interacted with them in business. Uh, obviously, uh, you know, Fran Tarkenton's down in Atlanta. I met with him and his son, Matt. And, and you're course, in Houston now? I'm in Houston. Were so you George, in Atlanta before? I was not in Atlanta before. I went down there actually looking into their business. Uh, they run a financial services company, so I actually went down there. Tarkenton and got to meet, Yeah, okay. called Tarkenton Financial. Interesting. So I uh, went down there, got to meet him and his team, and I uh, got to know him fairly well. And, of course, being in Houston, you know, you get to see George Bush every now and then, so yeah. I interacted with him. And then, of course, Rudy Rudiger, if you've ever seen the movie Rudy about the short little Irish kid. I've talked kid. with Rudy. He's a oh, cool have you? Rudy's yeah. a great guy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I met Rudy. And then Kevin O'Leary I've actually met three times. Okay. And uh, he's not the hard-ass most people take him out to be. <laughs> yeah, I remember he spoke at our Traffic and Conversion Summit event one year, a few years back, I think 2014. Yeah. And uh, we had dinner with him and chatted for a long yeah, time. Yeah, so absolutely. He's an interesting guy. A lot of those people do well. Fran um, seemed like he, like he came out of uh, pro ball and then did a whole bunch of stuff. He was like a spokesperson for a whole bunch of things. I think he did some infomercials. Well, he did some infomercials. He was very instrumental and very big with a company called Guthy Ranker. Yeah. And so it was really Guthy Ranker that made him a lot of money. Like you said, the infomercials and stuff like that. And then he actually got into the insurance business and actually now has a FMO, financial marketing organization, that basically lends his name to advisors that want to market fixed and equity index annuities. Interesting. And so he's really huge, obviously, in the insurance industry today and has built a you know mega multi-million dollar company using his name, leveraging that brand, and nice. has people all over the country working for him. And so when you went down to chat with them, what, what was that uh, like in a speaking thing? Or? No, it was really just to, uh, to kind of uh, explore what they were doing. I was giving consideration earlier in my career to doing that and mm -hmm. just using that to kind of supplement what I was doing. To being like one of his uh, li licenses. Exactly. I mean, I've got an insurance license, and oh, so okay. I do that on the side, and uh, I help people with that. And so just went down there and really got to meet him, met his son, Matt, met some of the other team members and have stayed in touch. And, uh, you know, his message, of course, is don't ever give up and always try to be your best. Uh, and as I've interacted with most of these people, each one of them has a story as to what made them uniquely successful. Mm -hmm. What traits, what qualities did they possess? And so as I kind of left the oil and gas industry, went into the business of raising capital for other people because when I dissolved my business in the late 80s, early 90s due to the collapse in the tax laws and also the depressed oil prices, I sat back and I said, what is Brad Blazer really, really good at? Mm -hmm. And what I realized I was great at was basically raising capital, talking mm -hmm. to investors. I raised you know, a couple million dollars for my own business and then since that point I've raised two billion plus wow. for other companies. Nice. And so that has kind of spurned what we call the Build a Beast coaching program and the second program called Mega Producers mm -hmm. where we train salespeople on how to get the right mindset to close mega million dollar deals. That's really cool. So let's, that's kind of a cool journey. I think one that you see a lot of people take is they, they start off, they have uh, some entrepreneurial things, um, and then they have a business that goes for a period of time, yep. and then they move out of that into something else, um, which you did kind of oil and gas into the fundraising stuff, and then kind of the... I won't say take it easy because that doesn't do it the justice that it deserves, but <laughs> but um, let's call it the the sharing 
and um, and kind of educating and mentoring and helping other folks kind of business. Does that sound? That, that's exactly where I am in life, is really just developing other people, sharing the traits that have made me successful. And if I can impact other people in a positive way, that's really all I'm looking to do. So let's go back to the, the very first uh, thing that you did prior to oil and gas, mm -hmm. um, your very first entrepreneurial kind of venture. Tell us a little bit about that. <laughs> you mean the lemonade stand? <laughs> uh, as close to that as possible. That's where I like to go. Yeah. Uh, not really. Uh, you know, when I was in school, uh, it was paper routes. It was working in restaurants. It was doing all of those things really just, uh, you know, to understand what it is to save money and to invest. It's funny how um, many entrepreneurs had a paper route, really, right? <laughs> you know? It's like, there's just something about that, even when you were young. That, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I guess, you know, that was before the advent of the internet where everything's online nowadays. Yeah. I mean, I don't even see papers in the driveways in our neighborhood anymore. There's you somebody know? that goes through our neighborhood, because I'm up super early. I try to get to work out around 6 a.m. And there's somebody driving around in the Tossing dark, the papers. throwing those papers out. Yeah, yeah. so it's, it's somebody still reading them. That's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so um, let's go past the paper route. What was the first kind of businessy type thing beyond that? You know, really, I guess the first businessy thing was uh, working in the oil and gas industry for other people. Okay. Uh, you, what, how'd you start out? Uh, I actually responded to an ad when I was going to school at UT in Austin. Okay. And uh, there was a guy looking to hire brokers to basically get on the phone and uh, solicit accredited you know, high net worth call. investors, cold calling. Nice. Uh, got trained up, you know, learn the script, learn how wells are drilled. And I did extremely well. I mean, I was working basically three uh, hours a day, mm -hmm. three days a week. Making close to eighty grand. <laughs> and, uh, and is that and this is back in the eighties. And is that phone book calling? Uh, it's no. It's just basically uh, they bought a list of accredited investors, okay. uh, fluent zip codes, and stuff like that. And so I just kind of sat back and I said, "Well, I'm working nine hours a week, making eighty grand. I wonder what I could do if I was doing this full time." Right. And so basically, without telling my parents, just one day quit going to school. Okay. Another common <laughs> and, uh, thing. Yeah. And so basically, I uh, started doing it full time, and of course, my income quickly grew. And I became the black sheep of my family when uh, my report card came out and uh, my parents received straight Fs and they uh, said, you know, what are you doing with your life? You're throwing it down the drain. Like, and then uh, about, a about a year and a half later, I came driving home in a brand new Porsche that I bought for myself. My brother came running out the front door saying, Dad, my God, you got to see this. Brad's got a new Obviously Porsche. you're dealing drugs. That's, uh, that's when Dallas was the biggest show on TV. Everyone wanted to be Jay or Ewing. Yeah. And so uh, I was Until now. Until he got shot. Yeah, and so I was now the J.R. Ewing of the family. That's and so, pretty cool. uh, you know, built that company up over a decade to a company that was raising millions of dollars a month. And okay, we had, so now when you say built that company up, so you were you started obviously selling for somebody else, right? Correct. Were, okay, so um, how long did you do that? I did that for a period of about two years. Okay. Yeah, started then with then one what? company that went to work for another company, found out the second company I went to work for, they were unfortunately committing fraud. Okay. And so I resigned, organized a class action, we prevailed. And so the investors that I had cultivated turned to me and said, well, what are you gonna do now? And mm -hmm. I said, I don't know. And they said, why don't you do it, but do it honestly. And so really the investors that I had sourced for this other company backed me. Hmm. And that's what allowed me to move forward and actually start the business. Okay, interesting. So do you think, like, were you having thoughts at the time, if you can remember back, were you having thoughts at the time, gosh, I kind of would like to do this myself? Or was it basically just kind of by necessity that this, you know, these guys were kind of You know, doing probably a little thing. bit of both, Roland, and uh, a little bit of uh, necessity because they were turning to me saying, you know, why don't you do it? I mean, you know, get a geologist, surround yourself with successful, like-minded people. Of course, you know, <laughs> in my 20s, uh, really didn't know much about starting a business. I just mm -hmm. said, oh, I guess I need some letterhead and some business cards, and, you know, you're off to the races. And right. uh, you learn as you go. It's really a journey. And uh, I tell entrepreneurs, you know, you don't need to have all the answers and understand everything when you open the doors to business. You're going to figure it out along the way, but yeah. you've got to commit and take action and start moving forward. And so, uh, you know, it was really just myself and a partner. Uh, he was in school at the time and uh, was an ROTC candidate. And uh, when he graduated, came over here to Miramar. And uh, I basically took over as the uh, CEO and then brought on more people. And uh, I think at our peak, we probably had, I don't know, 35 people on payroll. Wow. And, and this uh, was ra just raising capital. Just raising capital. And then, of course, drilling for oil and natural gas, primarily Texas, Oklahoma, Louisiana. And, uh, so selling. did you, you do the drilling or were you kind no, of No, no. Yeah, to... we outsourced to drillers. Yeah, okay. so we didn't have any drilling rigs. We were just basically raising capital, putting together drilling programs, and then hiring the people actually out in the fields, the Schlumbergers, the Halliburtons, the dressers to do all the technical work. Mm -hmm. And then of course, all the production we sold to Coke Industries. So That's that was cool. basically the refinery that we sold all of our production to. Okay, and then, so so what did you learn about raising money? Because you've raised a ton of it, $2 billion <laughs> is quite a bit. So for folks that are thinking about 
that they'd like to do that, but they just don't know where to start at all. Sure. What, what kind of advice would you give them? Well, you know, um, the thing I tell people is there's plenty of money out there, more money than you could possibly fathom. I think the big problem is most people don't go out and ask for it. Mm -hmm. uh, there's something that I teach in part of the Build a Beast training program, and that is how you develop what I call prey drive. It's mm -hmm. constantly be closing, right? And most people don't close, they sell the flirt. When somebody gives them an ejection, they say, Roland, great, let me send you an email, a couple of attachments, I'll call you next week. And they try to move the process forward, mm -hmm. but they never ask those hard closing questions. On a scale of one to 10, are you a two or are you an eight? Mm -hmm. What do we need to do to move forward in the process? You sound like you're ready to commit. What's holding us back from getting started today? So questions like that, that salespeople really like have to rehearse, a few times. you have to just be <laughs> able to spit them out naturally. Mm -hmm. And uh, I share the story about this one very wealthy doctor that I was working and I knew he was worth a few million dollars because he came out to see me on his private Learjet. Right. But he just wouldn't invest. Mm -hmm. And so I said to myself one night, he's either going to close or he's not. And so as we were talking, I said, Dr. Schnack, it takes two things to invest in oil well. He said, what? And I said, big balls and lots of money. Which of the two don't you have? <laughs> <laughs> I swear to God, That's I funny. bit my tongue. Uh, and I said to myself, I don't believe that just came out. And right. after what seemed like eternity, as you know, in sales, the first one that speaks next loses. He said, how much are three units in your program again? That's and funny. I said, go get your checkbook. And he became one of our best investors. Hmm. Most people don't have the brass balls to do that. Mm -hmm. But if you're going to be a closer and you're going to close mega million dollar deals, you have to develop those because that's what it takes to talk to people that are worth millions of dollars. They don't want to be talked up to they want to be talked at. And right. so you have to project confidence. You have to have, of course, the confidence in what you're doing and in your business to be able to have those tough conversations. So I want to get back to some more of that, but take me through the rest of the journey. So you, you were raising the money there. Raising the money. And then what happened after that? You know, it was probably uh, the late 80s, I'd say probably 88, 89, Tax Reform Act took away all of the incentives for the most credits, investment capital. Like exactly. Yeah. Uh, oil prices plummeted from 36 to $9 a barrel because OPEC obviously was in much more control. Mm -hmm. And so I just basically said to myself, there are things affecting the business that I can't control. Mm -hmm. And obviously as an entrepreneur, I didn't want to put a lot of the savings I had accumulated back into the company and run the risk of going bankrupt. So I just made the decision one day to slowly consolidate and eventually dissolve the business. And I called all my employees in and I said, look, you know, I made the decision to shut the doors. Mm -hmm. We're going to do it over the course of about a year, year and a half. We're not going to file for bankruptcy, but all of you are going to get severance. You're all going to be taken care of. You're mm -hmm. all part of the family. And so I closed the doors. And uh, it was one of the most tough, challenging things I've ever had to do. Hmm. Uh, you know, here I was now in my uh, you know, early 30s, not knowing where my next paycheck was going to come from. Right. I had not completed my undergraduate training, so I lacked a college degree. And there aren't too many companies willing to write mid six figure checks to guys in their early 30s that don't have a college degree. <laughs> right, right. You so, have quite, uh, a, quite a track record. Though. So, I went back to school and uh, actually changed majors. Interesting. Uh, decided what was the major originally? My original major was architecture. Okay. I've always been great with my hands, I've always been great in design. And so, I wanted to study architecture really to use those skills to become a real estate developer. Okay. And uh, decided after owning a business for nearly a decade, why not get a business degree? Right. And so I basically re-enrolled, went through an entire four-year degree track in two and a half years. Uh, Would came you do out, that again? Um, you know, knowing what you know, looking, like looking back, what I know now, probably not. Okay. But it was important, I think, for me at that time to go back and do that because I really needed what I thought to be a credential to get back to the level of income I would aspired to. Knowing what I know now about being an entrepreneur. Probably not. So that was a mindset thing. But right? it was just a mindset thing. And then really from that point forward, started raising capital for other people, real estate sponsors, oil so, and gas sponsors, et cetera. So help, help me a minute with the school thing um, for the people that are listening that think they need a degree to get to the next thing or to be successful sure. in business because you, you kind of did it in reverse, right? You went out. Uh, I did it in like, absolutely gonna, in reverse. I'm going to get a degree that's <laughs> maybe not, nece not necessarily considered a business degree in architecture, even though you had a business purpose developing for doing it. Sure. Um, then you you pop out of that because you, you're making 80 grand, you know, working three hours a day or three hours a week or whatever yeah. it was. And then, um, and then you have that business for 10 years and now you stop, you have the confidence of, Hey, I've, I've made a ton of money out of this, like during this time, yeah, you know, had absolutely. Some, some changes. You made that hard decision that most people don't make, which by the way, congratulations, because most people, when things change, they just think they need to, to work harder yeah. and they invest all their money and they end up going broke yeah, exactly. by, reinvesting in the business that isn't working anymore. Um, That's exactly right. So how, I, I got a lot of questions around this. Um, how would you advise somebody right now that sees changes 
coming that's had a successful business, but we're, we're uh, by all of the pundits' uh, uh, opinions, we seem to be headed into a more, if not recessionary, certainly a more laid back mm -hmm. economy. Sure. What, um, what would you tell people who are seeing that, that writing on the wall or seeing increased customer acquisition or decreased conversions or regulatory changes in their markets right now if they've had a successful business, things, things are kind of trailing off? What, what advice would you give them? The, the biggest thing I see in the conversations I have with people is in situations like that, most people want to contract, right? right? They want to put their arms around everything. They want to hoard the money. Mm -hmm. They don't want to reinvest. And really, my personal thought is that's when you want to double down. Right. That's really when you want to be reinvesting. That's really when you want to be expanding. That's when you want to be going out and attracting more clients because the majority of people out there are doing exactly the opposite. Mm -hmm. They're contracting, and so that allows you to capture more market share. And so what I tell business owners is in periods like that, like you just explained, don't contract. Be out there hustling. Be out there following up with leads. I mean, we know just from the research we've done, it takes seven to ten touches to convert somebody from being a prospect to a customer. Right. The sad thing is most people give up after the third or fourth attempt. Yeah, or first. Imagine what could happen if you went the distance. Right. And so I tell business owners, don't play on the defensive. Play on the offensive. Go to work every Monday morning where you've planned the week that Sunday afternoon so you know who you're going to call, who's in your feeder system, who you've got to reach out, who you've got to touch. Follow up on the people that love you that are doing business. Ask what additional services you can provide. Uh, it's so unfortunate that in the sales world, sales take place, and then the salesperson or the company that made the sale never provide any additional follow-up. Mm -hmm. I've asked my doctor, do you have a thing here in the office like an open house where you bring in hors d'oeuvres and serves drinks and invite your patients and ask them to bring a friend? Mm -hmm. Think about how many more patients you could add to your practice so if you did that twice a year. Yeah, my favorite One, story is buying three cars yeah. and, and, and <laughs> never, never having a follow-up. Never. I mean, never. to yeah. this day. So funny. If I was, if they ever listen to this, it's like, you know, come on, really? Yeah. So, um, okay, so now what's interesting about that, and, and I, I agree, and the statistics bear that yeah. out as well. as I know uh, Porsche was one of the few companies that when the um, 2008 recession came, invested up to their marketing budget and ended up acquiring significantly oh, larger absolutely. market share. And, and there's just story after story of that. But you didn't do that when things changed back in the day. Correct. So help people understand the distinction of like, because I understand there were different factors, but just so people can say, well, wait a minute, now he's saying double down, but he, he sure. didn't do that. Yeah, great, great question. Uh, back at the time, it was like investment capital fell off a cliff. Right. You have to understand that back in the early and mid-80s, there were investment incentives for people to invest in these types of drilling programs, tax credits, write-offs, things of that nature. Those essentially disappeared. And so the ability to reach out to accredited investors and high net worth individuals and convince them to invest in an oil and gas drilling program, which was relatively risky because there is always the risk of you know drilling a dry hole, yeah. it was almost non-existent. And so I realized if I can't raise that capital to continue going out and drilling, and also at the same time, especially in Texas, which is where the majority of our production was, it cost roughly $11 to produce a barrel of oil, but the commodity was only selling at nine. Right. So you were essentially losing $2 for every barrel you were producing. Mm -hmm. You're in how, a, how long did that happen? That last? lasted for a period of about two years. Yeah. And so how said, long into that did you make the decision? Uh, probably about nine months into it. So, okay. I mean, I was putting money back into the business. You know, yeah. I was paying the bills and everything, and I just said, I don't know how long this is going to go. You know, I, I can't continue putting money back into the business. It's like feeding an animal. If you hadn't, you know? if you hadn't done that, because I think part of the reason of getting out was you also had this this desire to complete the. Well, we were we right? were a debt free company. I had yeah. no debt on the books. Uh, I knew I was sitting on literally mega millions worth of production that was obviously in the ground that we were hoping to get up to the surface so we could sell. Right. But like I said, you know, when you can only sell the commodity for nine dollars a barrel. And it costs you eleven to produce a barrel. You're losing two bucks for every barrel. And you're twenty eight, twenty nine. I was uh, twenty nine at the time. So now, if the if the current yourself advised the other yourself at that yeah. time, would the advice change? Um, knowing what I know now, it probably would. Uh, what I it probably, sounds like you went back into the fundraising after. Right? I went to fundraising after. Probably what I would have done differently, knowing what I know now, is brought in a strategic partner, a very mm -hmm. deep pocket, you know, billionaire oil company guy. Mm -hmm to sell into or something like that to say, look, I've got all of these different fields. I've got these wells. I just don't have a billion dollar net worth or even a you know, $500 million net worth. 
and I would have basically uh, sought to be acquired okay. and uh, done it that way. What I essentially ended up doing basically is just slowly consolidating the company, selling off some of the production to uh, small operators here and there. Uh, because at the time, I really didn't know about M&A and about acquisitions and about that whole investment banking side to the business mm -hmm. that I, of course, know now. Mm -hmm. uh, so if I was able to go back and speak to myself as a younger Brad Blazer, probably would have done it a little differently. But I mean, I still have no regrets for the life I've led and the things I've done. Yeah. You know, like I said, not many 23-year-old kids starting multi-million dollar oil companies. Yeah, exactly. So now when you went back into, after you got the business degree, did you, were you thinking about different things at that time? I was, uh, absolutely. You know, um, having had tremendous success at a very young age, that's actually when I started writing the book. I actually started writing oh, the wow. book, believe it or not, in uh, the late 1990s. And it just got published uh, in it May? It just got published in May of this year. Okay. And the reason, of course, is life took a turn and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I had a family and uh, never really finished. And so... Just uh, one day I was in my office looking at this big stack of notes saying, you know, I really need to dust that off and finish it. Uh, and so obviously I did and uh, then put together the outline for the second book. And it was really kind of a very funny experience. The book came out in May and a good friend of mine uh, went to buy it on Amazon. And he calls me and said, you know, your book is number one. And I'm like, number one where? Like the New York Times bestseller list? He said, no, it's uh, the number one book for young entrepreneurs. And I said, you've got to be kidding me. How does that happen? And apparently somebody over in England that writes this huge blog read it and they put together a list of the top 10 books for entrepreneurs and mine was number one on the list. That's so cool. And so when I saw that, I said, my God, we need to begin promoting that to all of the universities and all of the online programs Super that smart. cater to Gen Xers and millennials and young entrepreneurs. And so we reached out to every major university across the country. They're using the book. They're inviting me to come in and speak to the students. And it's just been a, a whirlwind in the last 90 days. I mean, I'm known globally. I mean, it was so funny. I was actually telling your buddy over here that on my birthday, my wife and I went out to celebrate the evening before. So we're out on the 5th. My birthday is the 6th. And I start getting texts and LinkedIn messages. Happy birthday, Brad. Happy birthday, Brad. And it wasn't yet my birthday. And then I right. realized these guys are over in Australia. They're over in, <laughs> <It is your laughs> birthday, They're over in China. They're nice. over in Hong Kong because I've been on global podcasts now with people around the world. And so part of that community and that following that we've created on the Art of Beliefology it's driven book sales. It's put me on stages, and uh, it, it's just been fantastic. So let's talk about that a little bit. So that um, you you continued to raise money for about how long? Raised money for uh, probably about two decades, about twenty years, okay. north of two billion dollars. Mm -hmm. uh, have closed the largest transactions for multiple companies, and those sales records still stand today. You know, eleven million, nine million, seven and a half million dollar deals, where the commissions alone mm -hmm. are more than many people make in an entire year. Sure. And so after the first mega sale, which was eleven million dollars for U.S. Allianz, which of course is a global insurer. I said, well, you know, lucky Brad. But then when I started doing it repetitively over and over for other companies, I said to myself, I know something that most salespeople don't know. Mm -hmm. That's how to close these mega million dollar deals because mm -hmm. I've done it repetitively now time and time again. And so one of the training programs that we've actually developed called Mega Producer mm -hmm. teaches that mindset and teaches those sale techniques so that you can go on as a sales professional and start closing larger transactions. As an example, we work with a lot of real estate agents, and I say, is it any harder to get listings on $200,000 houses or $2 million homes? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree with that 100%. Yeah. And so, you know, naturally, some of the people realize, well, if I can spend the same amount of time and get listings on multi-million dollar properties. How to 10x your income. Uh, something more <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. Right. So it's a no-brainer. It's just that a lot of people don't think that way. What would you say is, um, and maybe it's that, but what would you say is the biggest surprise that people who go through that program to come away with? It's really like coming, that, yeah, it's that, really coming out the other end, understanding that there were many limiting beliefs and that there were things holding them back that were false beliefs. Uh, so many people have self-doubt and limiting beliefs. And, you know, I've studied MLP and I understand that you really have to look back in your life and ask yourself, where, where did that belief come from? Mm -hmm. And, you know, nine out of ten times it came through your childhood because most of those false beliefs are developed between the ages of seven to ten. And then it's challenging them and trying to replace them with a new belief system. The problem is if you just do that, it ain't going to work mm -hmm. because beliefs are reinforced through habit. And so what I ask people to do as part of this training program is let's replace that false belief with a positive one and now ask yourself, what would a successful person do differently 
than what you're doing today. Mm -hmm. I say, you're showing up for work every Monday morning and you're living on the defensive. You have no idea who you're going to call. You don't have a hit list of 25 <laughs> prospects or people that you're supposed to be following up with. Successful people start planning the week Sunday afternoon. Right. So when they show up Monday morning and they know exactly what events am I planning, who am I collaborating with, they live life on the offensive. So start doing those things. And so when I show people my day planner, I say, who's the first appointment with every day of the week? Brad Blazer, 530 to 7. I'm in the gym. Right. Because I know if I don't plan for it, it ain't going to happen. Time. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. So start planning out your life because you're really the architect. I've coined the phrase, become a lifestyle architect and become a fulfillionaire. Nice. Fulfillionaire is the word I use to describe having balance where you not only have monetary possessions, but you also have balance spiritual, emotional it. connections with other people. Mm -hmm. uh, Stephen Covey writes about that, and I explain to people, as I know, there's plenty of people that have money, but live a miserable life. Oh, yeah, amen. And so if you ever seen Jerry Maguire when Raj was looking for the Quan, <laughs> remember the Quan? Mm -hmm. My word is, I want to be a fulfillionaire. Nice, I like it, great word, I like yeah. that. You can use it. Um, the uh, it's not <laughs> the um, so now hopping back for a minute to school because some people that are listening um, uh, are think making those decisions right now. Should I go back? Should I finish? Um, other people are parents. Um, do you have kids? I do. Okay, how are your kids? My daughter's eight. Eight. Okay. Yeah. So now when your daughter comes to you for advice about college, let's yep. say, what are you going to tell her? You know, I think there are reasons you go to school. Mm -hmm. um, certainly, you do not need to have a college degree to attain great success in mm -hmm. life. But I think it also teaches you how to deal with people. Mm -hmm. uh, it teaches you how to create friendships. Uh, if you go to certain schools, obviously, those friendships can transcend the academic life right. where partnerships are created. So I think there's something certainly in getting an education. What I would explain to people is you don't need the education to achieve success. Mm -hmm. But going through that process and going through college allows you to understand how do I interact with people? How do I live with the roommate? How do I create these friendships? How do I network? Because I'm a firm believer in networking. Mm -hmm. um, and while in school, you should avail yourself of the different clubs and understand that school really should be used as a networking learning experience so that you can maintain friendships that go beyond just the diploma. Mm -hmm. um, and I would tell my daughter, you know, go to school, but go there understanding you don't need the degree mm -hmm. to be successful. If you believe in yourself, you'll be successful irregardless. Mm -hmm. Go there to understand how friendships are cultivated, how to network. Uh, learn from your, uh, your teachers, learn from others, because if you understand how to do that, when you come out, your chances of success are going to be far greater than not having gone through that experience. Right. I think I think it makes a whole lot of sense. And and for somebody who doesn't go, what would your advice be to them? And as far as sure. like, like I've decided I have an opportunity, I'm going to, you know, pursue that or whatever, um, what what would you tell them? You know, the thing that I've found and of course I've read uh, studies, uh, Harvard did a great study where they found that only 3% of the population out there has taken the time to clearly write their goals down mm -hmm. on paper. Uh, there's something that takes place when you physically take your goals and put them in writing, and it's called implantation. It's part of what we call the mind-body crossover. And that 3% out-earns the other 97%, not 5x, but 10x. Right. And so when you look at that process, what I tell people is everything in life starts with goals. Mm -hmm. Okay, Mark Cuban says there's a difference between a entrepreneur and an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. And I firmly believe there are three types of people. There are blamers that blame their lack of success on other people. My boss didn't give me the tools I right. needed, or right. my wife doesn't want if me to start If only my mom had made me take this piano. Uh, whatever. Yeah. Then, of course, there are what I call the dreamers. Mm -hmm. They have these great ideas, but they never take action. They never move forward. They never face their fears. And then there are game changers. Mm -hmm. People like you and me, Roland, they're going to figure this shit out one mm -hmm. way or the other. We're just going to move forward in life pursuing our goals and dreams. And so for those that don't go to college, that want to be entrepreneurs, the biggest thing I can tell them is take action. Don't think you need to have all the answers because you won't. Mm -hmm. Just go ahead and commit yourself and figure it out along the journey because that's part of life. It's a journey. And understand that failure is okay. Look at uh, Colonel Sanders failed a thousand and nine times, right, right? Right. Look at Thomas Edison. Every time the guy failed, he said, that's just another failure. I'm one step closer to success. Right. Yeah. I like the commercial that came out. It didn't last long with Michael Jordan. <laughs> it was a great one. It was like, I guess it didn't perform, but it, to me, it was like the most brilliant thing. And I still remember the very first time I saw it 
all of the yeah. failures that he talked about, and then he said something like, I fail, therefore I succeed. Well, yeah, if you ever saw the movie about McDonald's where Ray Kroc, you know, going out there, uh, who was the guy that was the, the actor founder, that was in uh, that? Uh, but yeah, he Tom, went out. Was it yeah. Tom Hanks? No, Tom Michael Hanks. It was uh, Mike Michael Keaton. Keaton. Michael Keaton. Yeah. I can make those guys. And uh, just going out there time and time and time again, knocking on doors, getting mm -hmm. shut down, getting no, 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 and just realizing I'm just one step closer to success. I like that he was in his 50s when that when his yeah. uh, success came too. So it's never too late for never too late. For never too late. I think Sanders was also. Well, Sanders had to be up there probably in his late 40s or 50s. He had the white beard. Yeah. yeah. He had to be up there as well. But you know, they had so much conviction in what they were doing, and mm -hmm. they had so much belief. Uh, in what they had that it just relentlessly allowed them to go out time and time and time again. And so you have to realize as an entrepreneur, if at first you don't succeed, try and try again. What do you think about supplementing the lack of education when somebody doesn't do, doesn't get the formal thing? Because the formal stuff is, is really mostly theory and outlines and a framework more than it is actual how to do stuff. Yeah, yeah we so all know that. What, sure. what are your thoughts on on getting education and where would you get it and what's the way to pick the best stuff and kind of filter that? Uh, there, there's so much stuff out there mm -hmm. and uh, one of the things I've realized is I've studied other successful people and as I've interacted or heard from all of these great thought leaders that I mentioned earlier is everything that you ever need is online today or mm -hmm. in a library. I mean, I went to an event years ago. Uh, it was back in the late, uh, it was actually in the late 90s, where they had this big real estate guru. You know, he's flying into town, kind of like Grant Cardone is doing today, different guy, but same concept. Yeah. And there were thousands of people in this huge auditorium. And of course, during the intermission, I mean, there was probably 2,000 people lined up whipping out credit cards, you know, buying five, nine, ten thousand dollars packages. And I said to myself, 95% of the people that are buying those never even going to open the books. Mm -hmm. It's disappointing and it's unfortunate, but I guarantee that 3 to 5% in the room will actually move forward and take action and start investing and buying real estate. And I said to myself, everything that they're buying is in the library. Mm -hmm. And so I went to the local library and started basically reading books on how to buy foreclosures, how to invest in subject twos, and within a year had 13 properties under my belt with a net worth of a few million dollars. Mm -hmm. Um, so I would tell the people that surround yourself with others that are successful. You have to realize that you will gravitate towards the friends you hang around with. And so if you have nine friends that are losers, more than likely you're going to be the tenth. Right. So, you know, start seeking out successful people. Ask them to mentor you. Ask them, what did you do to achieve the level of success you've aspired to in life? And there are many industries where you can make great six-figure incomes where you don't need a college degree. You can become a financial advisor. The right. average income for advisors stays probably north of 200000 mm -hmm. You don't need to have a college degree. You just need to pass the FINRA registrations. Yeah, same thing for real estate. Same really. thing for real estate. I know the absolutely. average, I think, is only 36000 a year, but that takes all the people yeah. that are just playing at it yeah, as well. Absolutely. So the thing I think really is just, you know, you got to commit. Did you have a mentor? Um, I've had multiple mentors over the course yeah. of my career. Tell me yeah. about how, the first one and how did you find him? Uh, when I was in the oil and gas business, actually, the first one that I really uh, latched onto was uh, Clayton Williams. Okay. Uh, Clayton was a great guy, of course, you know, out in West Texas. And uh, I'll never forget, I was actually at a uh, large gathering of oil and gas operators at the Texas Railroad Commission because mm -hmm. in Texas, actually, the Texas Railroad Commission is kind of the governing body okay. that oversees the industry. And this was the late 80s. And so uh, Clayton was actually going to be a speaker there. And really, now, the did under you go to hear him, or did you not really I didn't, know? No, didn't even okay. know him. But uh, the underlying theme of this entire meeting was the Texas Railroad Commission, at the time, was sending out notices to operators that were sitting on production because if it costs you two dollars a barrel to produce and you're losing money every day, what you do is you just shut the well and you mm -hmm. turn off the pump. You're just going to wait it out. Well, you can't do that because in Texas, the oil rests above the water mm -hmm. because oil is dense. And so the thought is you're going to damage the aquifer. Interesting. So you get a letter in the mail that says you've got to put your well back in production or the penalty is $10,000 a day per well. Wow. It's a very serious penalty. No kidding. So small operators are being put out of business left and right. They're filing for bankruptcy. So they called Clayton William and there's no Clayton William. So the guy who's up there at the podium says, Clayton William, are you here? Everyone's looking over their shoulders. Clayton! And all of a sudden, at the back of the auditorium, the doors open, and here he comes dressed as a dinosaur. He had rented a dinosaur costume like Barney. And you think a big tail wagon right down the center aisle, and was laughing. And he got up there, and he said, look, you guys are idiots. You don't realize that there are many small operators here in the room that you're going to put out of business, and they're all going to be extinct, just like the dinosaurs. That's and he got a standing ovation, actually, that afternoon. And so I went up, and I introduced myself, and I said, I loved what you do, because I'm a small operator. Right. 
and your message really resonated with me. And so, uh, you know, we became uh, not friends, but certainly acquaintances where we exchanged emails and uh, phone numbers, and he became a great mentor as it related really to aspiring me to try to continue to the best of my abilities, but I just realized months later, it's just a worthless effort. I got to move on in my career. So many speakers are inaccessible after that. I mean, you get, and as yeah. a speaker, you know, the people run up and it's, you're trying to talk sure. to everybody and it's a really bad time. It's kind of probably the worst time to try to get to know somebody. If you were looking for a mentor or giving somebody advice on how to find one, what, what would you tell them? Well, LinkedIn has changed the landscape dramatically today. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I read a book many years ago and had another mentor, Walter Haley. Mm -hmm. Walter Haley started off as an insurance individual and met an individual by the name of Tommy Love. Tommy Love was also in the insurance business, and he realized when he was at networking events that people said, what do you do, Tommy? I sell life insurance. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he wasn't going to become a person of interest. Right, <laughs> people right, were going to run right, yeah. in the other direction. <laughs> so, <laughs> so what Tommy Love understood is I've got to lead with my value. Mm -hmm. And so what he explained to uh, Walter Haley and also to myself is that when you're in a networking event and people say, what do you do? Don't tell them. Step back and say, before I tell you what I do, Roland, can I tell you what I believe? Mm -hmm. I believe everybody in life deserves to work with a coach. I believe those that are coached will outsell, out-earn, and more dramatically outproduce their peers. Mm -hmm. I believe that if you change your beliefs, you have the ability to change your future. Let me tell you why I believe those things. Mm. And then you lead with, let me tell you now what I do and mm. what I do differently. Mm. Because the person in their mind is saying to themselves, I believe those same things too. And now you're using the natural law of attraction, where business is now coming to you right. rather than you having to make all those phone calls to call out for business. And so Walter Haley was one of my mentors and he wrote a book called Near Marketing. And this was actually back in the 1980s. He said, you're only five to seven touches away from anybody in the world you choose to do business with. And of course, you know, we're all in our 20s saying, yeah, bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> well, he proved it to us. We had about 30 people at this big retreat at Walter's Ranch. He said, tonight after dinner, you collectively think of an individual that we will contact before the end of the weekend. Mm -hmm. And so we thought Prince Charles. Mm -hmm. He got up on the big whiteboard. You, you were probably all going, <laughs> and, and Prince he, Charles. And he, he, he asked the room, how many of you here know anybody in England, friends, siblings, nieces, and nephews? And, you know, probably a third of the room raised their hands. And he got about three to four people deep and said, okay, my team will take it from here. Two days later, there was a phone on the little stool in the corner of the room, and it came the moment of truth. And sure enough, he dialed, and on the other end was Buckingham Palace. Uh -huh. And they had been contacted by his team and informed what he does and the training. And sure enough, we were on the phone talking to Prince Charles. That's really funny. Now, this was, of course, you know, 25 years yeah, ago yeah, before yeah. LinkedIn. Yeah. But today, with the ability on LinkedIn to basically link with anybody, of proof. is chances are you're not going to send Mark Cuban or somebody like that a request and get them to link to you. But what you can do is look at their circle who you have in common mm -hmm. and work through one or two connections to ultimately make that connection with the person you want to reach out to. Yep. And so by doing that via LinkedIn or just business connections, I believe very strongly that you can make those introductions and collaborate with people so that you're getting introduced and included with some very powerful people that mm -hmm. have the ability to really transform your life. I'm a firm believer also in having an elite mastermind group. Mm -hmm. And so in the coaching and just meeting people like yourself, I've cultivated these various groups so that as I bring people in to my coaching programs, I say, you know, if you want to also be part of the mastermind group and get on a phone call once a month, right. you can do that as well. So I want to get into your programs that you have a little bit, and I just want to ask one more thing before then that will hopefully deliver a lot of value for people. So let's say that somebody's interested in raising um, two, three million dollars mm -hmm. for their business. Uh, since you've had such vast experience and helped other people do it and trained people in sure. your business, what would the steps be to that these days? The easiest way to raise capital, whether it's a real estate project or starting a business, mm -hmm. is there are plenty of places you can go that sell lists of high net worth accredited investors. Okay. Uh, most financial planners, stockbrokers start off cold calling. Where would you so, find the list? So let's, uh, you let's can just go it. on the internet. You can just Google. Google. Yeah, just okay. accredited not investor. Like one source that's supposedly. You can, yeah, you can just okay. go on the internet and Google accredited investor list, and you'll see multiple companies that sell these lists. Okay. And usually the way they're structured is by zip code. Mm -hmm. So as an example, if you live here in San Diego, more than likely you know the affluent zip codes, mm -hmm. the affluent uh, little pockets of wealth. Yep. And so you give the company the zip codes. 
and you'll say something like, you know, I want to target households that have an income of three to four hundred thousand, where the average age of the investor is fifty-five to seventy-two. The value of the home is one point two million X, and they'll say, you great. Want all of those things are either of those. No, things? all of those things. And all so the okay. guy on the phone will say, great. In that zip code, we have twenty-five hundred leads. Great. Okay. And how much is it? And so you buy the list. How much would you expect to pay for a couple hundred bucks? Okay. You're pretty cheap. Okay. And so then what you can do is do a mail merge and actually send invitations to people that reside in that community and mm -hmm. invite them to an event at a nice restaurant. Nothing over the top fancy, mm -hmm. but some place, and you'll typically get an average response of one and a half to so two percent. Like Bruce Chris dinner or exactly. something. Exactly. Like so tell me, because I, I get lots of those things, yep. tell me what um, what seems to perform the best, what, what works the best in your experience over time? Uh, you know, Image, um, how would you word that? You know, uh, you can just say, you know, please join us at Ruth Chris Steakhouse to learn about uh, investment opportunities in real estate or how to become successful. A couple bullet points, boom, boom, boom. Okay. And typically you'll have, you know, 40, 50 people show up. You have them pre-register. You do it real nice. Do they early. pay for this or is it free? No, nope, it's okay. free. Okay. Uh, and so typically everybody will have a nice name tag. And then what you really do is you develop a nice PowerPoint presentation mm -hmm. so that you go in with confidence and feeling very professional. And then obviously as you introduce yourself, you might have a team of people behind you, whether it's your wife or whether it's an admin or somebody that works uh, with you in your business. Uh, and basically have an evaluation form so that everybody can basically leave their name, their contact information, give you positive critique, hopefully, on the event. And is really, there an indication of interest in investing? Absolutely. Is there a specific opportunity that gets presented? Uh, there can be. I found sometimes it's better not to present a specific opportunity. Kind of sell the concept uh, of a... If it's a fund where uh -huh. you're selling more of a fund where you're going to be acquiring property, then it's really more of a fund structure where it's a blind pool. Mm -hmm. If there's a single identified asset that you want to go after, maybe it's an apartment building or maybe it's a medical office building, certainly you want to highlight that. What if it's your company? That's fine as well. Okay. Absolutely. You can so do it that way. How do you format that? So they come in. Come in, explain who you are, give a little do you, background. Do you have like networking time or do you just kind of have them sit down and go straight into yeah, it? Yeah, I would just uh, basically have them come in, get their name tag, sit down. Uh, yeah, when everyone's seated, basically, uh, you know, you kind of clang the glass and say, you know, folks, I'd like to introduce myself. This is mm -hmm. Brad Blazer. I'm going to talk tonight about my business. I'm an entrepreneur here in town. We're starting a company, we're raising some capital. Mm -hmm. Uh, we want to kind of introduce you to what we're doing and uh, kind of walk you through a presentation. We'll have some Q&A on the back end as well. Mm -hmm. And basically do that and then obviously provide networking at the closure so those people that are interested can hang around and ask questions and explain to everybody that you'll be following up in the next three to five days. Okay. For those people that are interested, what I then do is schedule one-on-one -on -one time. Okay. Meeting in, in their home. In person or on a phone? Uh, in person, preferably. Okay. At the residence or in an office okay. or in you know country club. I live in a country club. Have okay. them come to the club. And really just sit down and ask them as an investor, what are you looking for? Is there a place that's best to meet them in your experience? Their um, home, country club, office, their office, I have office? found at times if they're willing to meet you at their office, that is the best. Because that's where they do business? Exactly. Okay. Uh, if not their office, a place of convenience, maybe they'll invite you to their home. Okay. Uh, you want to make it as easy for them as you possibly can. And then it's just a matter really of just, once again, explaining the opportunity, discussing projections, what their return expectations are for them as an investor, mm -hmm. and letting them know with absolute confidence that you are going to be a fiduciary to their hard-earned money. Okay. That is the biggest fear. For people that don't know what a fiduciary is, we just yeah, give them Fiduciary basically is you're going to treat their money as if you're going to treat it as your own. Right. The biggest problem we have today is, you know, the Bernie Madoff of the world and all of these people that, as we know, are out there that are crooks. And so you really have to explain to people that, you know, here's a track record. Here's what I've done in the past. Uh, here's what we're doing today. And uh, we're going to treat this as if it's our own capital. Here's my attorney. Here's mm -hmm. my CPA and let them know that you have a team of other people that are going to provide things like quarterly reporting, newsletters, communication. The biggest thing I learned as a business owner, especially in the oil and gas business mm -hmm. where there is the true risk of drilling a dry hole, mm -hmm. is you got to deliver news whether it's good or bad. Mm -hmm. Don't try to cover up. Don't try to bullshit because a lot of times in business, as you know, things don't go your way. Right. Life ain't easy. Right. And there's going to be bad news. Trust me. And the worst thing you can do is not communicate the bad news. If you communicate the bad news but explain to the investors that you have a plan, they will often reinvest with you again and again because of the honesty and the integrity. And they realize that there were circumstances that may have been beyond your control. Sure. 
But when you bullshit your way through or worse yet, you don't even tell them the bad news, right. you've destroyed a relationship that's taken you a long time to cultivate. Okay, a couple questions, um, details. At the presentation, the dinner, mm -hmm. how do you dress? Um, I usually dress uh, in a uh, suit without a tie. Okay. Yeah, Great. so just, you know, it might yeah. be a sports coat. Professional, but not. Professional, but not over the top. Okay. Um, and then typically when I go meet them for the second follow-up, uh, it'll just be a nice pair of slacks and a nice dress shirt. Okay. And at the first meeting, collateral material-wise, you have your presentation. Absolutely. Are you handing things out to them? Uh, sometimes what I'll do is I'll make a nice little folder okay. and I'll get third-party articles that support what it is I'm doing. Fantastic. Uh, so that you have that credibility, you have that fluff around your presentation. The other thing that I also believe very strongly in is just a one-page fact sheet front and back that highlights the investment opportunities with photographs, projections, things of that nature. Okay. Uh, because a lot of the investors, to be real honest with you, aren't going to sit down and read a 100-page PPM. For sure. They just want to know what are the bullet points, what are the highlights, what are the opportunities, and then obviously go through the PowerPoint presentation. Yeah. And for those of you that listen to PPM, is private placement. Yeah, private placement memorandum. Yeah, kind of yeah. the legal document. Yeah. That it's the legalese that has all the disclaimers. But you don't <laughs> hand that out until you at least would be the second meeting or that's even correct. after that. Right? That is correct. Okay, so that's first meeting. Now, uh, yep. that's, that's the big one where they're having dinner. Now, you're meeting with them at their office or whatever. What additional materials do you bring to share? Typically with on a second meeting, what I'll bring is I'll bring the PPM. Mm -hmm. I'll bring basically any financial projections that are tied either to the business or to the opportunity or to the real estate itself. Uh, the other thing that I will also do basically is bring additional copies of the information they've already taken mm -hmm. in case they want to share that with other people. Mm -hmm. Because I believe very strongly that a lot of these individuals that came to the event probably have country club buddies or business associates yes. that may also want to invest. Yeah. But what I've also found is many a times they're going to take it to their CPA. Yeah. Many times they want to run it by their attorney. That's fine, but what I realize is most CPAs and most attorneys poo-poo deals. Correct. So what I always try to do. They have no risk do, if they say no. Absolutely. And they have tremendous risk. So, if they so say yes. the thing that you want to realize is that's okay, mm -hmm. but always preface it. Well, I love for you to speak to your attorney. When can we go meet them together? Together, right? Be assumptive. Don't yeah. don't say I'll call you next week after you talk. To say when can we go meet him what together? What of the time would you say you ended up going? To uh, probably 85% of the time. Really? Absolutely. And if of you, that, any kind of closing percentage? Uh, probably 95%. Biggest challenge in meeting with the attorney or professional for people that are scared to do that? Um, you just, you just, you know, you don't, you don't know what they're going to say. But I think the thing that you have to understand is that if you don't go, your chances of closing the sale zero diminish support, considerably. Right? Yeah, it's only the downside. But if you go, and I've actually found this, what happens often not is they'll invest themselves. I was mm -hmm. actually raising capital for a conservation easement deal, which is the best way for high achievers to dramatically reduce their taxes mm -hmm. because you can reduce your adjusted gross income by 50% through an act of Congress. Wow. And so for a guy making six, eight hundred thousand dollars, how'd you like to be in the three percent effective tax bracket and right. pay fifteen, twenty grand a year in taxes when you should be paying hundreds of thousands? Is so that I, a leveraged write off or no. No, okay. It's it's a it's a congressional act. I'll mm -hmm. tell you about it later. But mm -hmm. uh, we went to actually see this guy's at uh, CPA. CPA said interesting. He said, Let me take a look at it. We came back the next week. The CPA said, not only am I going to invest, all the partners in the firm went in on it, too. So That's we had actually awesome. eight partners in this big account. Like, yes. <laughs> and by the way, tell your friends, too. And so it was really one of the best transactions that we ever did because we had educated the accounting firm that literally had no knowledge right. of this body of law that allowed them to do what we were wanting to do. But once they researched it and found out this wasn't a loophole, this wasn't a shelter, this is an act of Congress. Mm -hmm. This is why Ted Turner owns millions of acres in places like Montana. It's right. conservation law. He's able to shelter his income. Uh, we not only, of course, closed the sale with the prospect we were talking to, we actually now got a CPA firm involved that actually referred us to many of the clients. Now, do you um, do you have people that help you raise money when you're doing that kind of, that kind of thing? Like um, Yes and no. Okay. Uh, I've actually worked for many real estate syndicators and sponsors, mm -hmm. either as a national sales director or just somebody working on their behalf. Uh, and then for many of the deals that I've done myself, it really is just me going out and buying uh, you know, small uh, multifamily properties, small apartments and things like that. And can you pay other people to help you raise the money? You can, but you have to be very careful. And I'm not an attorney. I'm right. not going to give legal advice because once you start collecting people's capital, mm -hmm you fall into a very gray area as to are you selling a security. Right. And so you really have to understand the securities laws and understand what it means to be an issuer, 
uh, and really always work through counsel mm -hmm. and understand if I'm going to be raising money from other investors or I am selling securities, am I doing it for my own behalf, mm -hmm. which is fine, right. or am I representing somebody else? When you represent somebody else, you now traditionally need to have your securities federal registration and securities license because then you're actually marketing securities, which is a little different issue altogether. Yep. Okay, that's really great. And then um, just to jump all the way back to the beginning, because I don't think I clarified this. So now you're making the call to the investor. You bought the list. I'm the investor. You're making the call. What do you say? Uh, really, what I learned when I was in the oil business is the process of raising capital, if you're going to be doing it over the phone, really there's four calls that take place. Okay. The first is really just a call of introduction. Hi, Roland. This is Brad Blazer calling from company XYZ. We're a real estate investment firm. Just want to let you know right up front, not calling to sell you anything today. Just want to find out if you have an interest in real estate, the tax benefits that are associated, and whether you like to get any information. Great. Awesome. And so really what you're doing then is you're just sending information to that prospective investor just to build that relationship, to give them something to seek their teeth into. Got it. The second call, you know, usually a week, week and a half later, did you get the information? Yep, great. Most of the time it's a smoke screen. You haven't looked at it yet. Mm -hmm. Understand that they're trying to get you off the phone. Mm -hmm. So what I usually do when that objection comes up is say, do you have it there handy or is it there in your office? Yeah, it's over here. Great. There's two or three things I like to point out to you. Okay. So you start to get them involved in that conversation. And on that second call, really what you're doing is you're just digging a little deeper, but you're trying to qualify them and understand what it is they're looking at from an investment perspective. Are you looking for income? Mm -hmm. Are you looking for tax benefits? Are you looking for growth and capital? And then you end the second call by saying, you know, I don't have anything to really offer you today. We always offer our prior investors the first Priority. right of refusal nice. on all ensuing programs. The next time we have an opening on any of our programs, would you like to be added to our list? That's great. And then the two or and three then, things that you pick to point them to yep. in, in the thing. What, what, in uh, the typically, they're just uh, projections okay. or uh, prior performance. If you have a prior performance history on mm -hmm. deals you've done before, it's really just to engage them okay. so that hopefully you leave them with some interest in what you're doing. And you can usually sense because they'll start asking questions. Okay. And once they start asking questions, as you know, that's a good thing because that means you're now engaged and you're involved in that sales process. Uh, the third call, of course, you're just calling back, say, you're all, you know, it's Brad Blazer here at Company XYZ. Uh, you asked to be put on our list in the event we have an opening on a program. We had a couple of investors that were just tapped out, okay. and we have a couple hundred thousand left. I'm just going down my list. I want to explain the deal to you. And really, that's when you're going specifically into the deal. I mean, the nitty gritty. Okay. How long is a call like that? How, usually how much 30, detail? Yeah, usually 30 to 45 minutes. Okay. And uh, on that call, you're traditionally either closing the sale then, or scheduling a follow-up on the fourth call to hopefully close a sale on the next call. Because really, at that point, they've expressed interest, mm -hmm. they've got the information, they reviewed it, and you're really hoping to close then or the following call. The following call really is the close. Okay. And that's where they thought about it, they have the capital, uh, and if they don't, that's when you've got to sometimes have those big bash brawls and right. say, you know, hey, it takes two things to invest in this or, you know, uh, what's holding you back? You sound like you're ready to commit. What's holding us back from doing it today? Uh, and, you know, the, the amazing thing that I taught myself is that people write you checks for fifty or $100,000 and send it to you in an envelope having never met you. Right. And I've raised millions of dollars that way by just cultivating that what I call prey drive. Mm -hmm. And it's the inability to overcome the call rejection and understand that every time I pick up that phone, whether I talk to somebody, whether I leave a message, or whether there's no answer, I just made a couple hundred bucks because you can look at your income average it out over the and time. average it out on the number of calls you're making and right. realize every time you pick up the phone, it's worth 200 bucks. Makes it more exciting to Makes pick up the phone, more right? Makes it more exciting. And so, of, no, no, yeah, no. And yeah. so I, I teach salespeople to look at it differently because most salespeople look at that phone as a 10 pound weight. Mm -hmm. They don't want to pick it up, but the if they look at it as a $200, yeah. they look at it as a $250 call every time they pick up the phone, you know, it's easy to make 40 calls a day. That's really great. So is there a close, like when you say that fourth call, um, it's not pressure, high pressure, but that first time not you're asking to pressure. make a close, is there something that you would say? You know, uh, I've closed so many in uh, using the takeaway sale. Okay. Uh, when there's reluctance, when there's hesitancy. Let's just say I, you we you called me up. This is the fourth call. I'm like, you know, you you just said here's the deal. What do you say to get me to 
close. Like, yeah, I, I'd say, does this look like something that you would have interest in investing in? Okay. And if I say yes, you say? Say, great, go get your checkbook. I'll explain to you how to fill out the paperwork and uh, fill out the subscription agreement so that we can actually get your investment process. And then off. they mail it to you? They mail it to you or they can email it, absolutely. Okay. Okay. Uh, if there's hesitancy or reluctance and they really are undecided, sometimes I'll actually take the opportunity away from them and say, well, you know, now that we're talking, I really don't even know if this opportunity is for you. Okay. And usually what happens is they, they start sell selling back. them. Exactly. Yeah. And so there's that process and there's really an understanding as a person raising money in the psychology of the sale mm -hmm. and in what's going on in this investor's mind. Um, but once they become an investor, as long as you're able to communicate and you have that level of reporting where, you know, every quarter, every month they're getting a newsletter. Is quarterly the I Quar ideal? Yeah, that's usually the ideal. Okay. Um, you have an investor for life as long as you treat them well. Biggest objections you get that uh, that you find that you have to overcome when people are... You know, if you do it properly, there really aren't any. Okay. Um, if you do it well and you've really worked with that individual, you've gotten to know them, you've built that relationship, really by the time you get to the third or fourth call, there really aren't any objections. Okay. okay. Uh, it might be that they specifically don't like the deal, and they'll tell you, you know, I really don't like this particular deal. I like what you're doing. I'd like to stay in touch. Talk to me on and the next don't push deal. it because you might blow the, the exactly. Next deal, right? And so you call them on the next deal. Okay. Uh, and that's fine. A lot of people like to invest locally. So you know, if you're doing a deal, for example, uh, you know, in LA, and they're looking to invest more local here in Escondido or in San Diego, and you know you're going to have future deals, that's great. Okay. Put them on a little tickler. And uh, what I did before the advent of you know things like Salesforce and uh, CRMs mm -hmm. is I had a little three by five box. Or in the front is I would go and get the little indexes, 1 through 31, which were the days of the week and right. in the back of the months. And I would just have little 3 by 5 cards, call Roland, January, and I would put it in the back of the box under January. So come January, there would be 30 to 40 cards, and it was basically what I call the primitive CRM I system. I still like that because people get so caught up in the technology that they're it, learning how to do Salesforce and not It falls right calls. through the cracks. And then it becomes comfort work, right? Yeah, oh, it, let me just reprogram it, the exactly. CRM or read the how-to. Yeah. So, you know, and it worked great for us back then, and it still works great today, and I still use that system to a degree. So, okay, great. That's really awesome. Thank you for, yeah. for sharing that. What? Um, tell me now, what are the training programs that you have created that you have available. And um, I guess let's start with um, with the book, the which the first yeah. book is called? It's called On the Wings of Eagles, on Learning to Soar in Life. And is that on Amazon? And stuff it's like? on Amazon, okay. absolutely. And what do we learn from that? The book really um, is nothing more than the compilation of messages uh, from all of these great thought leaders, mm -hmm. the, the George Bushes, the Rudy Rudigers, the Kevin O'Leary's, the Magic okay. Johnson's, the Joe Namus of the world. Uh, so you're actually learning from them okay. as well as from me. Of course, my background as a CEO of a small oil company, uh, and I share some stories uh, throughout the book as well. But really what that book does is it creates the concept and philosophy that if you change your beliefs, you truly can change your future. And we've actually trademarked the phrase, the art of beliefology. Uh, so that phrase and kind of what we have preached and that philosophy is is trademarked and protected. Okay. And are, is that the thing that um, the blog folk, the blog person in the UK I yes. think it was wrote about, and and that's what generated. That's all this correct. Speaking. So that book, the uh, on the wings of eagles, learning to soar in life, uh, is the book that is currently rated as one of the top reads for young entrepreneurs. Great. And so now, when people read that book and want to find out more, you have some other programs that are available. Correct. So the second book uh, will be out late November, December. That's called A Blueprint for Your Better Self. Okay. That really is the how-to. Okay. That's what I call the secret sauce. That's so the first you, one is the aspiration, inspiration. This is the, this let's is, get because there. Because people will read the first book and say, I, I buy into this mindset of changing my beliefs, but how do I change? Right, okay. And so really the second book digs deep into this is how you really transform your life. This is how you become a lifestyle architect. These are the things that you do to move forward and take action. And, and so what, that's, what is it going to be called again? It's called Blueprint for Your Better Self. Okay, great. Okay, so now um, let's say I read those two mm -hmm. and I still want to go deeper. What, what else do you have for folks? So the two coaching programs uh, that we offer, the first one is called Build Your Beast. Okay. And Build Your Beast is a six-month coaching program where over the course of six months, really what we're doing each month is we're drilling down and really beating it into you one of seven different demonstrated capacities. Now, the seven capacities are somewhat tied to what we call the parable of talents okay. in the Bible. And that is, as a student, you cannot progress to learn the second talent until you've mastered the first. Got it. 
And so that's why I just don't coach on something once on a webcast or in one session. I drill all month on that one concept so that at the end of the month, you have mastered that talent okay. and probably can now actually go out and teach, teach it to somebody yourself. else. Okay. The second month, we now work on that seven talent and then, okay. of course, the third talent. So over the course of seven months, you're learning things like how to create a legacy selling system, how to attract leads, how to create feeder systems, how to use funnel marketing. These are the seven talents? This, the, no, this is just the first talent, which okay. is how to create basically what I call the legacy selling system okay. to get leads. Got those are parts of that. Yep. The second talent or the second capacity is how to provide million dollar follow up. Okay. It's understanding that you need those seven to 10 touches, the difference between linear and non-linear uh, reach outs. Okay. The third, of course, is basically how to become a person of interest, how to develop what I call that explanation of services to lead first with value and beliefs. So over the course of this six-month program, you're basically understanding how to become more attractive as a salesperson or professional, how to generate more leads, how to create better follow-up, how mm -hmm. to overcome objections, how to develop this thing I call Prey Drive. Okay. And so that is what we call the Build the Beast and Coaching. And how do you understand what Prey Drive is? Prey Drive is the ability to optically see something okay. and then go for it. Okay. It's prevalent in dogs. Okay. It's prevalent in all your big cats, like your lions and tigers. Got it. And the problem is most people don't have it. It's buried deep in your subconscious. It's P-R-E-Y? P-R-E-Y. Right. Yeah. Okay. Which is why most salespeople uh, sell the flirt, as I call it, right? Okay. They yeah. sell the flirt. You're very cordial. Oh, you know, great. Okay, you get an objection. Okay, great. You don't run a buy today. Let me send you some stuff, and I'll call you next week. Well, of course, when you call next week, the guy recognizes your caller ID, yeah, yeah. and that sale goes down the spiraling black hole, and right. it never closes. Right. And so I teach people how to develop that prey drive so that you're constantly jabbing and you're constantly getting affirmations and small yeses throughout the process. Mm. And prey drive, I tell people, you know, if you've got a small dog or like a, you know, a little a golden doodle or a little friendly lap dog, and I take that dog and I give it to the same trainer that's training the golden, uh, I mean, the, the Dobermans and the Rottweilers and the German Shepherds, mm -hmm. and I give that dog back to you, you're not going to want to be in the room with that dog for more than five to ten minutes because that dog's prey drive has now been trained and it is now a killer. Huh. And so prey drive is really something that is driven internally by some things. One is a fear of loss. Okay. High achievers are so fearful of losing the lifestyle that they've attained mm -hmm. that their prey drive is now innate because they know if they're not hustling and they're not closing, they're going to lose the big house. Right. They're going to lose the big car. Right. A second way to cultivate prey drive is competition. I just want to be number one, mm -hmm. and I'm going to do whatever it takes. I'm going to hustle, and I'm going to bust my ass because I want to be the top salesman in okay. the company. Kind of a status-oriented. Absolutely. Right. Another one, of course, is how to develop prey drive is understanding as a manager how to push your buttons mm. and how to prod you so that you develop that naturally. I uh, had a chance to uh, meet and uh, talk to Michael Irvin, the NFL player, mm -hmm. and one of the roles he had on the team was to go out and actually meet with all of the other players. And so he tells a story one night of him in the home of one of the other players, and there's this other player holding his newborn baby on the couch, just rocking this little baby throughout this 45-minute conversation. He did not put that baby down. You could just see the love in that man's mm -hmm. eyes. And so one day in a big game where the Dallas Cowboys were playing their big rivals, the Washington Redskins, yeah. Michael thought this guy just wasn't giving it his all. And all he had to do was turn to him and say, is that all you can give for that beautiful daughter of yours back home? Man, she deserves so much more. And he said literally the next quarter there wasn't an offensive lineman that came through that guy <laughs> because that's all he had to say. He it just lit him activated. up inside. He activated that prey driver. He's like, you know, it's kind of like the story I said about balls and money. He knew what buttons to push in this guy where he was going to show Michael Irvin, I'm, I'm going to do it for my daughter, buddy. Right. And so as a manager, you have to understand how to push those buttons in the people you hire, what their goals are, what their aspirations are, so that you can constantly nudge them when you feel... They're not giving you 100%. I mean, the, the Navy SEALs know that most people only use about 40%. Right. And so if you're a runner and you're out jogging and you're three miles in and you're running, you're fatigued and you're tired, you're ready to give up, physically your body can deliver 50 to 60% more. Mm -hmm. The guys out here, right, that are SEALs know yeah. that. Yeah. And so David Coggins talks about that as part of his message. Yeah. The thing that you have to understand is most salespeople – have call reluctance. Yeah. They look at that phone, they're like, man, I don't want to make the calls because it's a fear of rejection. Mm. And so you have to understand that quit selling the flirt, develop the closing skills, 
get the conviction in your product and your services so and that I when you're on the phone. I planting the belief, like you said, to dollar cost average it out and say, you know, it's, Absolutely. it's not a rejection I'm going to get. It's going to make $200, right? You're one step closer to that sale. Yeah. That yeah. could potentially be a you know a big sale for. So you. now is the prey drive activation part of your program as well? It is that? absolutely okay in yourself and in others. Absolutely, okay. you Fantastic. bet it is. So that's building the. Beast. That's the build your beast. Build your beast. Yeah, and then yeah. the, the other, other one, one is, is a six month program as well, and that's called Mega Producer. Okay. That is really very similar but different, and it's really geared more towards sales professionals. Okay. And it's how you develop the innate skill to go out and close mega million dollar deals and literally 10x your business. Okay, cool. Whether you're in real estate sales, whether you're pharmaceutical sales, whether you're an entrepreneur or business owner, because what I've learned in closing mega million dollar deals is the mindset and what you say is very different than people that don't close mega million dollar deals. What's the, what was the one thing that you would say is the big, big, big thing that if somebody could maybe take yeah. from this and say, not only am I super interested in the rest of the program, but this will actually help me today. I think the big takeaway really is that many salespeople look at the prospect or mm -hmm. the person they're talking to, and they're like so enamored. That guy's worth $100 million. Right. And they talk up to them almost on their hands and knees, please, please invest with me, or please, please be a customer. Mm -hmm. And so it almost comes across as desperation, like you're begging for the for sale. Sure. Yeah. And, and I'll tell you, people of wealth have a sixth sense. They've got that little spider sensor. They, mm -hmm. they can tell that there's desperation. They can tell when you're not talking to them eyeball to eyeball. And so the biggest message that I share with people that really want to cultivate the ability to close mega million dollar deals is don't look up to people and don't look up and be enamored. Feel confident. Walk in strong. Give a firm handshake and project the image that, you know, you're no different than me. I mean, I'm a mover and shaker, and I'm making a million bucks a year too, buddy. Right. And if you take that attitude and you take that mindset, nine out of ten times, you're going to close a sale. Why? Because you're using that law of attraction, and people like to do business with people they perceive to be just like them. Like attracts like. Absolutely. Business is nothing more than the exchange of positive energy between two people. Right. But if the guy doesn't perceive that you have the confidence, there's no chance in hell in closing that sale. Exactly. So thank you so much for coming and sharing all this stuff. There's a lot of really, Absolutely. really great, valuable things. It's been things. great. So what, um, for people that want to reach out and get a hold of you and find out more about you, your programs and that kind of stuff, what, what are all the places they can Well, there, that? there's uh, two websites that I'll give. Of course, I'm on all social media, LinkedIn, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. As but, forward slash Brad Blazer? Well, the easiest way to find me is we've created basically a landing page. If you go to my URLS, my URLS dot CO okay. backslash Brad Blazer, that will have links to everything, social media, the website, how to contact us, become part of our community. Okay. If you're interested in basically the coaching programs or the book, it's just www.bradblazer.com. It's B-R-A-D-B-L-A-Z-A-R. And uh, we'd love to have people connect and become part of our, what we call, beast community. Uh, the beast community just basically means that you're able to access the Facebook group and network with other success-minded people from all over the world. And, and that community you, is growing daily. Do you have a podcast as well? I do. It's okay. called Learn to Soar. You can find it on iTunes and Spotify. Awesome. So Learn to Soar, we've interviewed some great coaches. We've interviewed the world's greatest endurance swimmer, Darren Miller. Uh, interviewed uh, a guy that is the only man to make it to the summit of Mount Everest with two artificial knees in his 60s. He's actually over in Nepal today as we speak, wow. climbing Amadablin, which is the neighboring mountain in the Himalayas. And this yeah, guy is. Because Everest isn't really enough. I mean, people have done that. <laughs> well, before. only 29,000 feet. And to do it with two artificial knees in yeah. your 60s? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, try something hard next time, right? That's really but, cool. uh, yeah, we've had some great people on the podcast, and people can really learn. And the message we try to share on Learn to Soar is if this guy, Darren Miller, can hop in the ocean and swim 22 miles with nothing more than a bathing suit and swim mm -hmm. goggles in water that's 62 degrees without the benefit of a wetsuit, right. then you can pick up the damn phone. Then you can do call. any. <laughs> yeah, and then you can pick up the damn phone and pretty much do anything that you set your mind to. That's Correct. awesome. Thanks yeah. again. Really appreciate your time. Absolutely. Thanks so much.